Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Ensemble Network webcast. My name is Lindsay Kajura, Manager of Diversity Initiatives for the Mining Industry Human Resource Council, and joining me today is two special guest speakers, Monica and Catherine from Language Advantage. As many of you may know, MIR established its mandate to identify opportunity and ultimately address the HR and labor market challenges in the minerals and metals sector. The Canadian mining industry faces a significant challenge in establishing a sustainable supply of labor that is able to withstand mining economic volatility. MIR, through its labor market intelligence, has identified a number of factors exacerbating this challenge. Canada's aging population continues to have a significant impact and diverse groups such as women and newcomers to Canada are underrepresented in the mining labor force. Our research indicates that women comprise half of Canada's population and about 48% of its labor force. Yet in the mining labor force, women represent only 17%. Improving this statistic involves a combination of collaborative solutions, from encouraging young girls to pursue math and science studies to beginning a gender-inclusive awareness of the industry, to appointing more women to senior leadership and board positions. Another way to improve our statistics is by hiring an international workforce. Hiring and working with international workforce in the mining industry comes with its benefits and challenges. Language Advantage will dive into the topic and share advice on how to overcome language and cultural hurdles to best integrate foreign workers, increase productivity, and achieve business goals. So with that said, I will hand it over to you, Catherine. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Catherine, and I'm the owner and director of uh, Language Advantage, Inc. I am here uh, today with uh, Monica, who is uh, one of our instructors. First, uh, I would like to thank Mir for giving us this opportunity to be here with you. Uh, we are going to talk uh, to you about the reasons and the benefits for mining companies to hire or work with a foreign workforce and some of the challenges that they might face when doing so. We will also address the importance of language learning in today's world and the positive impact it can have on your professional but also on your personal life. Being here in Canada and especially in Toronto, I'm sure you've been exposed to one or more foreign language. If you've been schooled here in Ontario, you might have studied French or you must have uh, learned some few Spanish uh, phrases before going uh, south during the, min the winter months, or uh, your company is doing or would like to do uh, some business abroad. Uh, so for all these reasons, and as the world is definitely uh, becoming more global, language and culture are part of it. Um, so here we are. Uh, we want to, to take this opportunity to also debunk some of the myths about learning and, and speaking a foreign language, as some of them are in fact holding back companies. Uh, we will also like to encourage you to share your own experiences. So we're going to talk about uh, the mining industry challenges, then the language learning landscape, uh, the company overview, and the myths about language learning and the power of language learning, and some uh, success uh, stories. So the challenges. Uh, so there are many reasons why mining companies want to hire or work with uh, a foreign workforce due to labor shortage uh, or that you, the companies are in a multicultural population and also sometimes because they want to bring fresh perspective. Then the second biggest reason is that they want to um, take their business abroad, so current or new exploration projects, new projects, and then also because the domestic sales are dropping, so they want to expand in order for, for their business to grow. So with those two um, uh, cha uh, challenges comes also uh, two important factors that companies need to address is the first um, is uh, the language competency and then the cross-cultural uh, competency. 
To illustrate uh, these issues, here is the story of uh, this uh, small uh, Japanese company called uh, Sake Casting, and they do uh, aluminum casting. In 2008, they were hit very, very hard with the financial crisis uh, because their products were slowly uh, sold in inland. So in order for their business to survive, they had to hire uh, foreign workers coming from the Philippines. And in doing so, and in order for them to be more competitive and more productive, they had to uh, give their Japanese employees some English lessons. At first, the Japanese uh, employees were quite resistant, but step by step, they understood, they realized that this is, was the only way for the company to survive. So with the English lessons and the culture, step by step, they were able to bring that integration of these new foreign workers. And as the language and cultural barriers came down, the company was able to turn things around. And now they are exporting 70% of the production abroad. And uh, they've been uh, having record profits. So this is a very from successful story that started in a very, very delicate situation, but they were able to turn things around. Also, what is very important there's the language part, but also there are, there's the cultural competency. So with the cultural competency, what is very important uh, to understand, it's time. Because time is uh, perceived different, differently depending on the countries, the cultures, and um, in, uh, in 1959, the anthropologist Edward Hall uh, coined the word polychronic for the cultures who usually have a distinct uh, concept of time. And this was brought in an article uh, that was written by James uh, McVicker, who is a partner at um, Denton's law firm here in downtown uh, Toronto. And in, in this articles, uh, James Vicker brought the three primordial uh, elements that are really important for companies to understand and be aware. So the first one is time, but then is uh, trust. And so here again, there's a big difference between culture, uh, because in polychronic cultures, like cultures in South America, usually trust is takes time it's a long-term relationships people are more oriented to long-term relationships so it takes more time compared to north american culture where the emphasis is more on documented legal rights and obligations and the third one is um style, direct style, or indirect style. So this is how people tend to do negotiations. And here again, companies have to be aware of what kind of style they are going to be able to use for their negotiations. Another example also that shows how uh, culture is important is um, the um, Currently, uh, in Canada, since 79, they uh, have feminized the, um, uh, the titles of the different uh, position that women slowly but surely are having, uh, are doing in the mining industry. And what was very interesting that in Canada, so it's been now more than 30 years that it's been going on, but it only happened uh, in France this in March 2019. So here again, um, it's, we can see that 
cultural and languages, you know, they have their own path and their own way of doing it. And the more the companies are aware of those two important uh, challenges, the better they can address and do business. Uh, with this slide, uh, uh, this slide shows uh, they surveyed uh, 600 um, senior executives in North America, and what uh, what we can see is that in order they're thinking that for them, in order to attract uh, foreign workers, what they have to do is improve the language training then they have to improve the overall performance of the business because when you have teams in different countries, you have to establish a common um, ideology, culture, business culture. And also this, the third one uh, that is very important is help people to learn to adapt to different cultures. And with the fast pace of our business these days, this also is uh, very, very challenging for company to be on top of all these different uh, challenges. But they, there's many, many companies that are trying to do their best in order to, to help uh, their workers to work better as a team. In this uh, next slide, uh, I'm going to talk about, before talking about who we are and how we do it, the different language teaching methods, because that has a huge impact on how uh, we help our clients learn uh, a foreign language. So uh, the first uh, is the traditional method. So maybe I'm sure you're aware of this. Uh, this uh, method started in the antiquity and lasted until the beginning of the 19th century. So this method, it was the focus was heavily on the written part and the way people were learning a language was through translating documents and most of the time was translating literature. And so they had to translate it from the native language to the chosen language and vice versa. So the focus of this method, language learning method, was definitely more on the reading and the writing. And the speaking was not there. So then in the 70s, 60s and 70s, we had the audiovisual method. And this, with this method, it was the intention was that we wanted the learners to be more verbal, more that they had more interaction. And so what uh, the way it worked is that the, the learners were uh, watching an audio visual document and they were repeating dialogues out loud. They had to reuse certain structure uh, and they had to also self-produce some dialogues uh, using picture. So this method was very repetitive and there's there was not much space for error and no autonomous uh, speaking. So then they decided we need to help people to be able to communicate. So in the 80s and 90s, they uh, came up with these uh, new methods called the communicative approach. So as it suggested, it's based on communication skills in order to speak. And it's mostly based on simulation of uh, communication situations and role plays. And now in the 2000s, uh, they uh, brought the, the method that is called task-oriented um, uh, method, where uh, with this method, it's in fact an extension of the communicative approach. And uh, it was created to help the or European learners to have a better result in learning and communicating together when they uh, open all the borders in, uh, in Europe. So it is based on real life task situation 
communicative activities. And so, for example, uh, let's say that you are going to meet some colleagues uh, from a different office abroad. So we will use and the, the instructor will give the learners all the information, the necessary information, the tools in order to be able to do this task. And uh, now with this method, the learner is in fact a social actor and he can accomplish real life tasks uh, in a given uh, environment or in circumstances. And this helps the learners to really get concrete results and to learn to be able to communicate. So who we are? So um, language uh, advantage has been uh, teaching and helping clients for the past uh, 21 years. Uh, we have um, uh, help be helping clients uh, in Toronto, the GTA, the big GTA, uh, but also in Montreal. And also we have clients uh, from abroad. Uh, we do uh, classes face to face, but also virtual classes. And uh, we specialize in teaching a sector specific vocabulary in the appropriate cultural context of the industry. And we work closely uh, with uh, our clients and our teaching team has a real passion for teaching and they are well traveled and they have taught in many uh, different industries and they speak several languages uh, French, English, Spanish, Portuguese, Russian, Mandarin and we just added uh, Japanese. So the, the way we, we help our clients uh, like mentioning, uh, like I mentioned uh, earlier, is that when we have a new client, we ask them in what situation they're going to speak, with whom, and what kind of rapport they want to build. So uh, it's definitely the methods that we use are the two methods, the communicative approach, but also the task-oriented approach. And this allows our clients to uh, enhance their skills in order to be able to help them to speak with their colleagues abroad or um, their clients. And not only abroad, because some of the companies that we work with uh, sometimes uh, have also um, foreign workers already working within uh, their, con uh, their company. So now I'm gonna pass the baton to Monica. Thank you, Catherine. Just going to switch screens. All right. Uh, can, can you see my screen right now? Yes. Perfect. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Catherine. So uh, my name is Monica. I'm um, I'm one of the, the French instructors. Um, I've been working at Language Advantage for the past year. And I actively work with uh, with a few of the uh, the mining companies that either have uh, headquarters in um, in Montreal or here in Toronto, but they do have activities in Canada, uh, but also in, uh, uh, in Africa, in Western Africa mostly. And I wanted to take uh, some time to uh, dispel uh, some misconceptions and some, um, uh, and some myths that people might have about uh, language learning. So, and that might actually be really holding them back from even uh, just you know, starting and, uh, and trying. And uh, number one that really comes up very often is, um, is the fact that we we often think that everybody speaks English. So it's uh, it's certainly true for about a fourth of the worldwide population, but there's still uh, about 5.7 billion people that do not speak English. And I uh, and I think mining companies do realize that a lot when they, especially when they do business um, in uh, countries such as uh, Mexico or Peru, um, or even companies that uh, in the within the Canadian context that operate between uh, between Quebec. Um, and Toronto very often, and I'm going to bring it down to um, uh, to the Canadian context. Uh, in Quebec, you actually have uh, only a very small amount of people who are uh, mother tongue Anglophone, and even though uh, they they do speak English, uh, very often uh, these professionals come into situations where they do interact in uh, 
in English uh, with people from uh, from Quebec, but then uh, when these people talking between themselves, the interactions happen in French just because it's much more convenient. And um, so many times clients tell me, I wish I understood what was being said, you know, in between uh, the conversation, and uh, and they and they couldn't. So um, yeah, that's um, that's a big number number one. Um, number two, and Catherine has touched on uh, this. Um, very often, and I think this comes with memories, maybe from from schools. When you uh, when we think of language learning, uh, we just think of you know boring uh, grammar exercises, filling out uh, empty spaces with uh, past tense or uh, whatever the teacher asks you to do. So grammar is definitely um, a big portion of language learning, but there's also um, what we call um, what we call internal grammar that that people do have. So when we when we process the language. Um, we have some sort of internal grammar going on in our in our brain, and by by essentially repeating and reusing uh, not repeating is not the right reusing the um, the expressions uh, many times, we actually understand and create the rules ourselves and are able to apply them when we need to speak uh, the next time. And and if we do at language advantage, we do obviously do some grammar exercises because some of the practice is necessary. We uh, like to think of it more as a uh, as a fun part of language learning, and so rather than imparting it as a series of, you know, definitions and things to underline, uh, we like to take maybe more of an analytical approach and serve them as maybe as puzzles to solve rather than things uh, to fill out. Um, third, employees are too old to learn a new language. Um, I actually hear this a lot uh, from people um, who, yeah, once you're past, uh, let's say, 25, 30, you're like. I know I've been out of school for too long. Um, I'm, I'm never going to be able to learn a second language. I'm never going to be able to be bilingual and speak. And uh, and this is actually a big one. And there's a lot of research um, uh, done. Uh, one is one more recent one is actually by MIT uh, that has proven that adults, if actually immersed in that language experience, uh, can learn a language to uh, almost the same same level of fluency as uh, kids do. Uh, the one big challenge we have as adults is uh, the lack of time. So, um, I mean, language learning comes with um, uh, comes with rigor, comes with uh, commitment. But if that adult is invested in the in the process, he can uh, very easily become uh, within a certain time uh, proficient uh, in the foreign language. Number four, um, it's enough uh, to just learn the language. Um, Catherine has said a lot about that culture, cultural component is uh, is so important. And very often some of uh, our professionals have learned this the, the hard way, especially when you're, for instance, dealing with cultures such as Japan or China or sometimes in, uh, in Africa. So things that can uh, often uh, make or break the deal, um, companies should really be, be cognizant of those and uh, incorporate them in the, the training of their staff because again, they can help them uh, do the business much more efficiently and often uh, speed up deals and uh, and uh, sign uh, longer term uh, uh, deals uh, as well. And lastly, uh, and this is with the with the rise of technology in the past few years, um, people sometimes think they can learn language uh, through an app. Um, um, maybe some of you have used Duolingo or Bubble. So all these are great, and they're actually a great um, complementary tool to uh, to an to a training that goes uh, that happens with an instructor, uh, but they they just have very very limited um, uh, ability to uh, to help you speak and get that feedback from someone and then uh, then ultimately uh, apply it later. Uh, let me just move on to the next one. Oops. Um, and I um, wanted to also take a few seconds just to get back to uh, the power of language learning. So again, um, Catherine and I have uh, have said a few things, but there's Really, the uh, one thing that's really important to understand is the, the connection you can create by speaking the language, the, the common language of the person uh, next to you. And uh, like I said at the beginning, 67% of executives said that language miscommunications lead to inefficiencies, and almost half agreed that it made collaboration more difficult, uh, slowing down productivity. And it, um, yeah, once you speak the language of the other person, it just uh, opens up a uh, whole new doors to a new world where you can really create uh, strong relationships with. Uh, it could be it could be colleague, it could be client, it could be other stakeholder. Um, and secondly, we um, uh, there's again a lot of research um, uh, that has proven um, uh, strong um, or the, the ability to improve uh, your cognitive skills. And it goes from um, being able to you know improve your memory functions, uh, um, being able to multitask, 
or problem solve um, because your brain essentially is um, it's kind of acting like a, like a filter and it's juggling with multiple things uh, uh, at the at the same time. And uh, another thing that has been proven is that um, professionals or I mean people who uh, do speak uh, another language uh, are also able to make wiser financial financial choices, which with the context uh, of a company is very important because when you speak a foreign language, you actually have the ability to react less emotionally to what is being uh, said to you. So you're kind of eliminating the, um, uh, the tendency um, and have a lower, I would say, lo uh, loss aversion uh, function, and which makes, um, which makes you make choices um, that could profit uh, uh, companies uh, further down the road rather than focusing on what's happening right here, right now. Uh, so yeah, just just mentioning a few, but we would be happy to share uh, many more links and research uh, that has been uh, that has been done uh, in this area. And if you have any questions, uh, you can reach out to us uh, as well. I'll put up the next slide and um, just uh, wanted to show you a quick overview of the um, uh, some clients that we've been working with. Again, uh, predominantly we work with uh, mining companies of various sizes. Um, um, such as uh, Glencore, IM Gold, Kinross, uh, excellent resources, but we also do work with uh, other industries um, uh, such as law firms uh, and even lawyers specialized um, in the mining industry, uh, but really predominantly with uh, with mining. So we have that um, long year expertise in um, in this sector and uh, instructors who've been teaching in mining companies for for years now. Uh, I'll hand it over to Catherine who will share just a couple of um, success stories and clients we work with and how we were able to help their teams become more productive when doing business in a foreign language. Catherine. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. So the first uh, example is this uh, success story is the, the story of uh, this uh, client. She's uh, a senior health advisor at uh, I'm, I, I Am Go. And uh, when uh, she started with us, uh, she was at a beginner high intermediate level. She had French, uh, learning French at school, uh, but she wanted uh, um, to be able to uh, read documents that she was uh, receiving. And after um, two years, uh, almost two years and a half now with us, she has, uh, she's, she, uh, she's uh, able now to read uh, these uh, documents and uh, not using the translation service. And this has a huge impact in her productivity uh, because by her being able to do so, uh, she has been able to meet any deadlines and also um, being able to engage uh, at a at a faster rate with her colleagues and uh, appreciate appreciating uh, you know the the value of uh, of uh, this uh, training and also what has been very very important for her that now she when she she is in a meeting where the majority of her colleagues that speak French, she's able to understand 70% of the conversation. And this is huge because uh, when you are you know, surrounded with people speaking a different language, being able to understand what is said at the time how, uh, allows you to make better decision, to be also better interaction with your colleagues. And it creates at the, at the, at the end of the day, you the she feels that she's more productive and su successful uh, another example um, we have helped uh, three uh, senior managers that are uh, working in Sao Paulo and the way we've been uh, working with them in Brazil uh, is helping them to enhance their English skills and they when they um, contact us what they wanted to do they were already also at a beginner high in intermediate level but because they didn't have that ability or that uh, they were not speaking English you know, on a daily basis uh, it was sometimes very hard for them to have uh, a 
lengthy conversation with their colleagues in Toronto or Sydney. Uh, so we help them where, with their conversation flow, pronunciation, but also uh, writing emails because nowadays uh, email writing is essential. And for them, they had to understand how to send uh, a proper email in order to avoid uh, miscommunication. Uh, so after six months of uh, working with us, uh, their confidence uh, they were they felt more confident and um, also they were able to interact with their colleagues uh, the interaction with their colleagues was more faster and more enjoyable uh, for them because what uh, before what they had said to us when we started is usually they were writing their emails ask a colleague to look at their emails and then they will send it so that was a lot of loss uh, loss of time and uh, consequently a loss of uh, productivity so these are the kinds of uh, scenarios you know stories how that uh, portray how we help uh, our clients to be successful uh, with the language that they chosen and also in, with those two uh, examples, you can see that language and culture is part, is very, very important, and this is how we help our clients to succeed. So uh, here is uh, some information about uh, myself and how you can uh, connect with us. The best way is to send us a quick uh, email and uh, I'll be delighted uh, to help you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for all of that information. Um, we have two questions that have come through that either of you can feel free to answer. The first one is, how does improved language lead to more inclusion? So, uh, because when what happens is when you are able to speak uh, different languages, or let's say the language that, for example, you are in a company and uh, the, your company is doing business or has uh, activities in Quebec or in West Africa or in South America. If you understand, you know, by learning the language of the, your colleagues or clients, what happened is that when you speak, it doesn't matter the level, even at a beginner level, what happens is that you create that connection with that person. And by creating that connection with your uh, co-worker or your client, this is how you include them. And so this is how they feel included. And they are more step by step, you are uh, increasing the trust because uh, languages by speaking, communicating, the person see, see you as another person, not as a threat. And that allows uh, the, your client or coworkers to feel included and to be part of your team. Awesome. The second question is, do either of you have any stories of individuals achieving promotions after improving their language abilities? I know usually the uh, what I've, uh, I've seen is that uh, uh, this, uh, the employee that I was mentioning from the senior health um, uh, manager at the I am goal that we helped with uh, she has said to us that uh, her boss uh, definitely uh, is more inclined to give her more um, projects where uh, where uh, she has to interact in French so by doing so definitely uh, this uh, client will be step by step getting more um, more strength and 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 be 
I, I believe that in the future she will uh, get a promotion, uh, like will get uh, promoted. Right. Yes, it definitely sounds like she's able to get a lot more opportunity with the with the new um, language abilities that she's gained. So that's great. It, exactly. Exactly. And, and and also, you know, being able to interact with her supervisor has made you know that relationship stronger. So, you know, the, the, the team, you know, uh, is also stronger. And so that I think that the, the company uh, is gaining from that, is that when you have people that are more comfortable working together, uh, they, it, it increases the productivity and, uh, of the company, but also in, in the, the people are gaining more and more uh, strength and are more successful at the end of the day. Right. Well, thank you so much, Monica and Catherine, for sharing your insight and expertise with the Ensemble Network. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today, but if you have any further questions or concerns that weren't answered in today's webcast, don't hesitate to start the conversation on Ensemble or contact Mir directly. This concludes our webcast. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday and join us next time for our next webinar. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Merci. Merci.